Welcome to Balance for Better. I'm Sarah Davis. I work for Seattle City Light, and I'm the chair of our Women in Power group. This is our second citywide International Women's Day celebration, and I'm thrilled that this year, Women in Power is co-sponsoring the event with SDOT's Women in Motion group. What is, yes. And what is even more exciting is how many other city departments have contributed to make this event happen. We have the Seattle Public Library just outside with the table. They're here with Women Write Life, featuring books and a curated reading list, celebrating women worldwide. You can check out these books at the table, and if by chance you don't have a library card, they'll also help you sign up for one. <laughs> you all should have a library card. <laughs> and next to the library table, our archives department is displaying historic artifacts, highlighting the women who helped build and shape our city into what it is today. Archives also provided the photos that were part of the video that was playing when you walked in. We have the Seattle Channel videoing and streaming the event, and Seattle IT has also provided a Skype option. These departments are creating a way for people with alternative work schedules or at work sites out of the downtown corridor to be able to participate. Helping staff the event, in addition to City Light and SDOT, we have volunteers from SPU's Women in Utilities group, and Seattle IT's Seattle Women Active in Technology group. We have our panel of women from across the city, representing Department of Neighborhoods, Finance and Administrative Services, the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, Seattle Parks and Recreation, Seattle Office for Civil Rights, the Office of Intergovernmental Relations, Seattle Public Utilities, Seattle Department of Transportation, and Seattle City Light. <laughs> On the legislative side, we'll hear from Councilmember Gonzalez following our panel. She has graciously sponsored the use of Bertha Knight Landis, providing a space where we can all come together and have these conversations. And last but not least, we will shortly hear from our mayor, Jenny Durkin. These departments have created a framework and a structure for us to come together under one roof as a city. But as with any structure or house, it's of little use if it sits vacant. It's reliant on people showing up to inhabit it as you've done this morning. People talk about houses having good bones. If our city departments are the bones, it's you, or rather it's us, who are the muscle, the veins, and the heart. Together, we breathe life into this event, giving these issues a voice. But before I go any further, I'd like to pause momentarily and do a safety moment. Safety is a priority for the city and a value we take especially seriously at City Light. In addition to safety being a priority for the city, the mayor recently revised our city workplace values and expectations. For the city of Seattle, our five values and expectations are racial equity and social justice, inclusion, learning, accountability, and stewardship. As city employees, we are accountable to one another and stewards not only of our public resources but of our culture. In an effort to build and shape this culture, the theme for this event is diversity makes us great Inclusivity makes us stronger. Our keynote speaker, Fariba Alamdare, and our staff panel will be talking about these values and themes over the next couple of hours. It is through these discussions that we hope to foster and further our collective learning. To do more, to be better. And speaking of learning, this event is available for training credit in Cornerstone. Opportunities to come together as a city aren't terribly frequent. There is value for everyone in taking advantage of them, even if only for a few hours, to engage together as a community. 
our CEO, Deborah Smith, who wanted to join us but is out of town this morning, highlighted the importance of community and teamwork in a recent Monday message. She noted how well City Light and other city departments came together to ensure the community wasn't paralyzed by the recent snowstorm. The more we can come together, as we are this morning, around something positive, the better we'll be able to work across departments when needs are more dire. Events like Balance for Better increase our ability as a city to weather future storms, no matter what form they take. Again, on behalf of Women in Power and Women in Motion, thank you for being here this morning. And it is my great pleasure to welcome our mayor, Jenny Dirk, into the podium. Good morning. So great to see you. I wish you could all stand up here and look at how great you look. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here today as we celebrate International Women's Day. Thank you for that great introduction, and thanks to everybody who's worked so hard to actually make this event a reality. We all know this doesn't just happen. Um, it takes lots of time and planning and effort. Um, all the things that you thought couldn't go wrong do go wrong the very morning of. Um, I'm sure some people looked out this morning and saw snow and thought, no, please. Um, I might have been among them. Uh, I really want to thank the Women in Power and Women in Motion for their steadfast commitment to the values that we all stand for, because I think these kind of gatherings are so important for us as a city, coming together to hear from amazing panelists, but to stop for a minute what we're doing, the work we're doing, because it's so hard and all-encompassing I look around this room and I've met many of you, some I haven't had the opportunity to talk to, but I know the work you're doing every day and how much uh, effort it takes, how much intentionality, and to be able to pause and be really ground our work in the things that we care about. I have to tell you, it is an incredible honor to be with you here today, Doctor. Um, what a treat to have Fariba here um, to speak to you. You know, she is at the Vice President of Boeing Global Learning Institute, but she's worked tirelessly in these areas throughout her life, and I think that you will hear from her some great words of wisdom. We all know how hard it is, and today I can talk about women and how hard it is for women. So here we're sitting in the Bertha Knight Landis room. The chair she sat in is right there in a silicon vault. <laughs> and it took 90 plus years to get another woman as mayor. I mean, really? You know, I don't know how many of you saw it, but there was just, I thought, the photo that captured what so many people in this room have known their whole life, the picture of the woman cyclist in Europe that they were having the, the big road rally, bicycle rally, and the woman who was the head of the pack caught up to the men who got to go first, and the cop was there to stop her. Nope, can't catch up with the men. Um, look it up, Google it, but it is a metaphor for, I think, in the workplace, what many of us feel sometimes, and whether it's because we're a woman, a person of color, LGBTQ, whether we're a trans person, so many times we're met with the barriers on what we can't do and why we can't do it in our experience. And that's why for me, really listening to our IDT who is working, talking about the workplace culture and how we needed safe places, but to have a common base, workplace values have to be universal. And it's one reason why it was so important for us to listen to employees in framing those up and for the first time have the same workplace expectations in every department, every division in the city that were rooted in mutual respect and letting people know that they do best when they can come to work as their whole self and that they feel respected and that they're rooting their work in really our RSJI principles to know that our job is not just to come and make sure that we deliver services like they're, like it's just a conveyor belt, but to know that the way we touch community every day matters so much to their daily lives and how this city feels. And every day what we do, what women do, what the men do together is allowing people to do in their lives what they need to do to raise up this city to be better. 
And we know the challenges we face. We know how Seattle has become an almost unaffordable city for most people. How the mostly communities of color have been pushed out as we've changed so rapidly. And as we're seeing that, that there is there a place in Seattle. And it's why days like this are so important. Because it's not just theory. It is real and it's palpable. And so it's good to stop and take time and think about how do we change that experience in our workplace and through the work we're doing for the people of Seattle. Because every day when we answer that phone or go out in the field or talk to people, every day when we work together as coworkers, every interaction we do, there's a choice. Are we going to make it more positive or are we not? Every interaction, everything we do. And for women, as we come together, we bring it to the table, a different set of expectations, experience, culture, and history sometimes than men do. And we can celebrate that and also look at the reality about why is it that there aren't more women in the workplace across the world reflected and paid the same and paid their worth. How is it corporate boards in America can look so much the same and not look like most of us? How does that happen? You know, how is it that time and time again, people are not included and we just accept it? So I think we challenge ourselves, we challenge the city to be a better place. As mayor, I listen to people and hear every day things we need to do better to empower women, to empower people of color, but to empower each of us to make that choice through every one of our actions. Are we going to make it better? Are we going to make it better? Um, and I think we can do that. I think that, you know, it was really great. One of the things that when I came in as part of our SGI initiative and my executive order required all of our cabinet to go through implicit bias training and the whole mayor's office to do that on a regular basis. And we took a whole day, we were downstairs, and it was a really enormously uh, helpful and insightful and challenging program. But at one point, the person who was moderating said, now this office looks different than most offices I've worked with. And I, I kind of cocked my head to say, thinking why? And he said, it's the first time I've worked with a majority women, person of color entity. And it hadn't struck me till then that the mayor's office through our hiring is a majority woman, people of color working in the mayor's office. Um, and it's, it can happen. Um, and it's intentional. So I just, you know, I have been so blessed my whole life to work with enormously great people in every sitting, to learn from people, you know. And I had, for example, uh, many years ago, the country of Morocco, a new king came in and decided that their parliament did not reflect and have enough women. So he declared that a certain number of seats had to be filled with women. Now these were not new seats that were created, there were seats in which men who had held those seats for a very long time existed. So suddenly, all the elections in Morocco were about how do we make sure we have women candidates who can get elected. So I was fortunate to be able to go over with an international group to do some training of women who were running for office. And it ran the gamut from the uh, Socialist Party to the Fundamentalist Islamic Party. And I came into this room and there was dozens and dozens of women and the first thing we did was everyone stood up to talk about why was it that they wanted to run for office, what could they change. And we started with the room with people very much bifurcated upon their party or their background, but then when they realized they were all there for many of the same reasons, to have a better life for their children to have more justice and equity. And they talked about those fundamental things. By the time we left, they were all working together at the same tables, sharing each other, talking about what their platforms could be. It showed me there's a microcosm there, that when we can come together and talk honestly with each other about the things we agree and disagree, that we really can move things forward in a way that helps people, that lifts people up, that is rooted on principles of fairness and justice and equity. And when we don't do that, it opposite happens. We fracture, we fight, we divide. 
So I think you're going to have an enormously interesting panel today. I wish I, 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 I saw the title that was, you know, the word balance. I'm not sure that's anything I have right now. Um, <laughs> So I can't stay for the whole thing, but I think you're going to have an enormously great panel. You've got an amazing speaker. I also want to call out Council Member Lorena Gonzalez, who is not only sponsored the room, but you're going to hear from is she herself is as always dedicated to principles of equity and justice. And her personal story is one that is so inspiring to me in terms of what she sees, where she came from, and what she believes is the right thing to do. And it's just a force she works with. Um, so I think you've got a great panel of speakers. I want to thank everyone for taking the time. I want to thank the leadership in my departments who permitted people and encouraged people to participate. It's really important that we do this. Um, I know how important it is to people to be able to have this time and to make real our promise of race and social justice and that we realize that even in this room, you know, where we are pulled together, we still are in a place in Seattle and across this country where the most difficult conversations are those based on race. And we can come together, I think, in places like this where women talk, that we have to be really t ready to acknowledge those issues and have a safe place for people to talk about that. Because if we don't get and be more honest about how we challenge and what the real impacts of systemic racism are and how we can work to pull those apart, then we will not succeed as a society. And I think that we, people in this room, I know that when we have gatherings like this, it's a first step towards that intentional thinking that how do we go forward in a way that really is going to lift people up, that honors what we're doing, and that empowers people. And then I'll leave you one last thing. And it doesn't hurt along the way as you're talking. Have a little fun. You know, it is you work hard, you deserve to be able to have some fun and to enjoy that companionship and creativity that comes from that too. So thank you for everything. Have a great, great day. Thank you to all the hosts and sponsors. Um, it's an amazing opportunity to have this. I think every year it gets better, it gets bigger, and uh, someday we're going to all get that balance. All right, take care. Thank you, Lady Mayor. You. <clears throat> you want a race? <laughs> Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Sarah, for including me in this event. I know it's cliche sometimes people say it's an honor to be here, but I really mean it. It's an honor to be here, um, especially um, at this momentous time and in a month of March where we really pay good attention to the role of women in our society. So um, what I'm going to share with you in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes is about my philosophy about valuing diversity and sharing a few stories how I practiced it over a very long time. Is that OK? Yeah. Well, I don't know what we can do. If it's not OK, this is what I prefer. <laughs> I just was polite. Okay. Um, as we all know, and you heard from the lady mayor, and we hear uh, over and over, valuing diversity is a very complex issue. And there is no doubt that our society, our community, government, schools, they have responsibility for recognizing the value of diversity. And, and as Lady Mayor said, create an environment that embraces our differences. No doubt. Would you agree? Yeah. OK. Now I have a couple of questions for you. And I'd really like you to think about it. Does recognizing the valued diversity only lies with our society? 
are we at the mercy of government, companies, policy, quotas, or there is more to it? So here is my philosophy. I believe there is more to it. And that is what we as individuals actually think of our own diversity and the value we bring. What is our opinion about ourselves? Do we see our diversity right from the beginning as a liability? All the time thinking there is something that is working against me? Or do we look at it as Asset. It could be an asset. And here is part of my philosophy again. I believe it starts with me. I play a very, very important role in valuing my diversity and seeing how I contribute to my community, to my workplace, and don't see my diversity as a liability but as an asset. And remembering, although our environment shape us, but it doesn't define us, I define myself. You may think she's arrogant, but it's not. This kind of philosophy gives me power, especially during tough times how I deal with challenging situations. I'm not giving the power of my career and destiny in the hands of others. I am responsible for it. Of course, our society and community have to embrace diversity, and a lot is happening. And we are in a great, great time. But don't forget the role we play. So now I know you're a tough audience, and you say, give us some example. How did it work for you? So I like to take you back to my kind of mid-20s. I am in England doing my PhD at a university that focuses, of course, on aerospace. I work for the Boeing company now. <laughs> so um, one day, uh, course director who was in charge of the master degree program comes to me and say, Fariba, one of the professors in two days' time cannot make his session and is around the topic you're doing your research. Would you be prepared to give a lecture? My immediate reaction was, of course not. Do you think I am crazy? <laughs> But I kept cool. <laughs> and I said, let me check my schedule. I come back to you the next day. I had nothing to do. <laughs> so um, these are the thoughts going through my mind overnight. Of course I'm not going to do it. I've never lectured. I am younger than half of the class. The average age for the master's degree course is 28 years old. I was younger. Don't calculate my age. <laughs> and then the majority of the class, I would say 90% male, because it's an aerospace industry. All the professors are British, and I have an accent. So I go to the class. I cannot get the respect of the class. And from next day, as I'm walking in the corridor, people say, do you know her? She can't talk. She can't teach. But if I don't do it, who knows? They say she's a PhD you know, student or candidate. So I thought, no, I'm not going to do it. Then I thought to myself, well, I know the topic really well. I know and I can prepare and have a very good structured presentation that when the student leave, they can learn from me. And actually, the fact that there are no um, diverse professors, it's changed now a bit, but um, virtually no one had different ethnicity but British. Maybe it's a good change. I mean, who knows? 
And I really relied on my knowledge, and I knew I am bringing something to the party. I'm not going there to say just because I'm diverse like me, I am going to bring something to the party. I prepared and prepared. Maybe I didn't sleep, you know. <laughs> and I went to the lecture room. My heart was coming out of my mouth because I don't know, you know, one of the most scary things is to stand in front of people and talk. I'm okay now. I, I, <laughs> you are, you're nice people. So anyway, I did my presentation. I took some questions, and I went back to my desk. And that course director came to me and said, Faribab, what did you do? I said, nothing. <laughs> and um, he said, the student liked you. And they said, can you do more? Now. It wasn't because I was really, really good. The professor was really, really bad. <laughs> so the reason I'm sharing this um, story with you, that defined my career. I realized I actually like teaching. OK, I like the research. I was doing a PhD, but I like lecturing. And then I was invited to do more. And that's how I went. I stayed in academia. And I got to a point that I could apply to become a full professor, tenure, guaranteed job forever, <laughs> and, and become chair of our department. So in England, um, when you have positions like that, it's advertised nationally and internationally. And anyone within the university and outside university can apply. Now, when um, the word got round that I am going to apply for this position and hopefully get one of them, my boss told me, haven't you heard of the glass ceiling? Swear to God. And I remember that moment. And I looked at him, and I said, yeah, I have, but I am planning to shatter it. <laughs> he loved that. Another colleague who I knew is um, really uh, caring for me, one day he came to me and said, Fariba, um, you may get disappointed. And let me tell you why. You won't get these positions. Um, look at the statistics. Of all the professors in the university, only two are females, and they are British. Now you can calculate your chances. And I thought, he's right, based on the fact. He's right. And I started doubting you know, whether I should do this or not. Then I thought to myself, I can do the job. I know I can do the job. And actually, the fact that there are two female professors and the fact that university is bringing more and more international students because they pay more <laughs> and qualified, um, that could work in my advantage. And also my cultural awareness, that could be an advantage. So when I was preparing for the interview, not only I focus on my technical ability, I really brought out this as my differentiator. Because all other applicants were male, and the majority were British. Now, this is a moment for me to differentiate and say why not only I can do the job, I have other advantages. And I made sure I brought those things up. And guess what? I got both positions. Yes. So, and my boss became my employee. But, <laughs> and we are friends. And we are friends, we're all of them. Then I thought life is good, permanent job. I came up the ladder up, you know. This is great. And, uh, and then a recruiter calls me and says there is a job in Seattle in Boeing. Oh, my immediate reaction, nah. <laughs> By now, I have two kids and one husband. <laughs> and that's how it should be. I don't know why you are laughing. <laughs> and 
um, and I thought, no, it's not just me. Uh, you know, go from my comfort zone, permanent job, nobody can touch me, to corporate America, from academia to corporate America, and trust me, everybody, this is the reputation outside the US. US is about hire and fire. It's not as bad, but I don't know why this brand is out there. Everybody saying, are you crazy leaving your permanent job, your comfort zone, go to US to work for Boeing, and in companies, and you know, in corporate America, the majority of companies bring people young and they grow within and the company and go um, as a vice president, uh, you know, just like that in itself has got its own issues. We can talk late. <laughs> anyway, so I thought to myself, no, 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 this is not bravery, this is stupidity. <laughs> so I'm not going to do it. But then on the other hand, it's all about balance for better, isn't it? On the other hand, I thought um, life is too short not to take a risk. And uh, I joined Boeing, it's a long story behind that, and uh, I don't regret it. I would repeat it over and over. Now, why I tell you these stories? You see a pattern. Every time, what I do to myself is when I have a new path, I start doubting my own ability. I start doubting that how my diversity as a woman and a woman that comes from Iran. Have you heard positive things? <laughs> no. So um, how would I fit into an industry that is male orientated? Isn't it safer where I am and now you know, I made it? Or should I go for another adventure? And what would be the consequences? And throughout these times, I am scared. I am uncomfortable. I love to say that I am certain and confident and very brave and cool. No. No. We all go through these emotions. But the point is that, what do we tell ourselves? And during all this period, I am thinking, as I am accepting more responsibility, what would be the impact on my children? For those of you know ladies that sometimes, um, especially thinking of having family, um, can I do it? Is it choice between my career or family? I am proud to say that both my kids are sane. <laughs> and one of them just finished her medical degree and she's working in the um, University of Washington Hospital, if you have any issues. Come on. <laughs> And my son is a Harvard-trained chemist, biochemist. So it is possible. That's another message I want to give, that it is possible. So what I want to emphasize is that when we think of our diversity, as I said, as a woman with different ethnicity, as a mother, as a wife, actually has got value, and we need to find out how it will make a positive contribution to our workplace, to our community, to our society. So I've developed this philosophy, and that gives me an inner peace, an inner strength. And it's not strength coming from the challenges that I face in my life. It's about knowing who I am, that gives me strength. And that's why um, I keep on telling myself that I cannot, uh, when I face negative instances, um, or you know, to blame it on my own diversity, because what happens, I become the victim of others' conscious or unconscious biases. And we don't want that to happen. And I find out over and over, when I trust myself, when I honor my diversity, when I go to that meeting, when I go to that place, when I have that interaction, and I don't think I am disadvantaged, but I think I am actually advantaged, and I know what I'm bringing to this conversation, 
often people honor my diversity and my differences. We are often the mirror of who we think we are. How come that we don't value our diversity and we expect others do that? That's very important to think about. So I developed this philosophy. I'm just sharing it with you. I'm not saying it would work for everybody. I'm sharing that I developed this perspective that I apply it to my personal and professional life. And we all know every day we wake up, every day we wake up, we tell ourselves a story about ourselves and about our environment. Do I like my workplace? Do I like my boss? Do I like my colleague? Do I like myself? All these thoughts shape the way we think, the way we behave, the way we decide. Just like going to the gym and we practice and practice, at least some of us, <laughs> to build muscles, we need to build our beliefs. And those beliefs doesn't come like a switch. It's like what we practice every day. So my question to you is that, what kind of stories do you tell yourself and about your environment every day to yourself? Thank you very much. have any questions, happy to take it. <laughs> and just to borrow the mic, uh, we are going to give this mic to Jessica. And would you mind using the podium mic? Sure. Wonderful. I, I have one over here. Hi, thank you for that inspirational talk. Um, so from where do you draw your inspiration to persevere against doubt, and what advice would you give to other women who face similar challenges? Um, again, uh, you know, as I said, this inspiration wasn't like a switch. It, it, it came, you know, um, practicing it over and over. Um, when I start doubting myself, I always try to, again, you know, better, you know, balance for better, you think, what about the other aspect? What about if, if I can park any issues to do with my diversity somewhere for a moment, and then see what I need to do? I especially do that during difficult times. You know, there are times that uh, things happen that um, I don't like it, or I, it can be challenging. So this is what I do. I tell myself, OK, you don't like it. Now you need to tell yourself, for how long are you going to be upset? Depends on the situation. An hour, two days, a week, but then what? You want to say, because I'm a woman, because I have accent, because I, my origin is from Iran? And how does that help you? Park them aside, look at the situation, get feedback, see what you need to do. The minute we allow those thoughts to overcome us, it paralyzes us. It means we can't do anything. This is my destiny. This is how it is. I can't change it. I wish I was born different color. I wish I was taller, shorter, this way, that. That kind of thoughts poison your mind and doesn't allow you to find solution. So after, depending on how bad the situation was, I park it, and now I'm into action. And that's what I do. It's not that scary to ask questions. <laughs> yeah. you, you can't do it alone. That's the one thing that, is, you know, it's clear to me growing up. So you must have had mentors and, and maybe had um, you know some support network because when you're going through it, you're acting against things that were uh, institutionalized and then you hear it. So you have to undo those stories, but it's very difficult to do it alone. And I just wondered how you uh, handled that. 
Great question, because I meant to mention that. I have a very good husband. And I always uh, advise everyone when it comes to uh, choosing your partner, uh, it's not that just their look and you know their wealth. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is important that you have a partner. And uh, I have a great husband. I'm uh, very supportive because uh, when I was in England, my family uh, and our family um, lived in Iran, so growing two kids with everything going on, without a good partner, it would have been difficult. So um, he is my source of inspiration, and, and then my children. Uh, I'm really fortunate. Not only you know they are sane, they are good people, and they are a great source of inspiration for me. And of course, uh, throughout our journey of life, we meet people who want to help you, and and everybody who helped me, especially at the beginning of my career, they were all male. They were all male who, at the same time that we had those comments, you know, that they come and, you know, praise you or give you opportunity. So when we are talking about International Women's Day, it's not a war between men and women. It's about focusing on ability of women and all of us as women may, you know, work together. and take advantage of the skills and these potentials. As a society, we lose if we don't. As a company, we lose if we don't. And that is all about it. You know, come together and, and see talent and provide opportunity for growth. Thank you. <coughs> No, thank you. Uh, how do you navigate the fact that most people relate an accent with intellectual capacity? Okay. Um, <laughs> I have, no, you're absolutely right. And we are talking about that in, uh, at our company because we are international and we bring talents from um, many different countries and we have offices in different places. So again, um, creating the balance is that, yes, our, uh, we need to talk about these things, that if somebody has an accent or speak a bit slowly, it doesn't mean that they um, have less knowledge or less capable. I'm, I'm here to talk about my um, story. So um, I always put my title against my name. And actually, when I moved from academia to corporate America, people said, well, we don't use title here. I said, well, I do. <laughs> I, I do. And uh, we have other people uh, you know, in our, our organization that they have PhD and they don't talk about it. And even some people said it may work against you because they think you have, I, can, I said, I don't care. I am Dr. Fariba. <laughs> so um, you, know, you sometimes have to push, and, um, but don't let, as I said, our environment shape us but doesn't define us. We define ourselves. Don't let those things get into your head, because once it gets to your head, it disables you to, make a, to take action, to find ways. There is always a way. There is always a way. I think we have one more over here. Um, if you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? Love yourself, respect yourself, and find ways to channel all that with your capability. We cannot go out and say, because I am different, embrace me. It won't work. We have to bring something to the party, whether it's our technical skills, our knowledge, something. We have to bring a value but then find our diversity, how that could differentiate us. My background is marketing. Marketing is about differentiation. If everybody is the same, 
you know, and actually at work they say, if two people think the same, we don't need one of them. <laughs> so differentiate yourself. <laughs> but you need to trust yourself. You, you need to know what you're bringing, trust that, and, and, and take risk and be courageous. People are the mirror of what you feel. It's like animal kingdom. You are scared, you become a victim. You are brave, less chances. That's my opinion. I'm not saying you know, it works for everybody, but try it. <laughs> so I think that's all we had time for. Thank you. Uh, so again, another round of applause for Dr. Fariba. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Stephanie Johnson. I'm the vice chair of uh, City Lights Women in Power. Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite our panel to come forward and take their seats at the table. And while they're getting settled, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank, thank some of the people who made today's event possible. Coordinating this event has taken the collective effort of an amazing team. We're fortunate to have some very talented individuals on our planning committee who've been working over the past five months to bring this event to you. I'd like to acknowledge them now. Committee members, as I read your names, please stand. Corinne Kennedy, Stephanie Guzman, Courtney Adams, Kim Kinney, Catherine Mork, Natalie Salazar, Amina Williams, Carol Butler, Veronica Green, Kathleen Wingers, Angela Bertrand, Becky Edmonds, Iona McKenzie, <coughs> Jessica Alinen, uh, Sarah Davis, and Holly Krejci, who couldn't be here with us today. Uh, let's give everyone a round of applause. We also have an amazing group of volunteers who are here today helping with check-in, cleanup, and general logistics. We'd also like to recognize the contributions of several local businesses who donated all the food and beverages served this morning. In keeping with our celebration of International Women's Day, we're excited that all the food today came from businesses that are owned or co-owned by women. So a big thank you goes out to General Porpoise for donuts, Fresh Flowers for macarons, Big Chicky for brownies, and Holy Cannoli for the cannoli. I know. If you missed out on the snacks or would like more, we'll provide links to their businesses in our follow-up email. Um, and you can find all of them at locations in Seattle. Also, thank you to Starbucks for providing us with coffee. And if you didn't get any coffee, you can find Starbucks everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but shout out specifically to the team at SMT who hooked us up today. Uh, and finally, I want to thank all of you for attending. We appreciate your willingness and enthusiasm to engage on these important topics. I hope that this event is celebratory and inspirational, and that it's also a place where we can learn together and grow. Learning and growth require us to challenge our assumptions and can frankly be uncomfortable. But that shared experience helps us build community, understand how to support one another, and allows us to begin meaningful conversations that will carry beyond this event. So again, I thank you very much for your participation. Um, and on that note, I'm pleased to introduce our next panel, whose topic is Be Seen, Be Heard, Be You. This panel is comprised of eight of your colleagues from different departments in the city who have graciously agreed to share with all of us from their experiences. They will address the concept of bringing your whole self to work, what it means to lead as a woman, and what we can do to create a supportive and inclusive culture. It's our hope that this discussion will increase awareness of our shared and different experiences and to elevate strategies to support one another in our individual and collective work. Because we want as much time as possible to hear from the panel on the subject matter, they'll introduce themselves and the department they work for, but you'll find a small bio of each of them in your program that provides more information. And so at this time, I'll hand things off to our panel moderators, Reagan Price from City Light and Manal Al-Ansi from SDHR. Yes. I claim them all. S, S, S dot. <laughs> I think she does, she, she's important. She has lots of places. Uh, so anyway, I ask you to join me in giving our panel a warm welcome. Thank you. 
Good morning. Welcome again to the 2019 International Women's Day event. My name is Manal Alansi, and I will be moderating this wonderful panel. And I'm Reagan Price. <clears throat> And um, so as you heard today, our theme is Be Seen, Be Heard, Be You. And we want to contextualize all that in the experiences of women in the workplace. Um, and so we're going to now ask all of our panelists to introduce themselves, um, just say their name and the department that they're with. And uh, then we'll jump right in so y'all can hear all their genius. OK. My name is Nicole Willis. I'm the Tribal Relations Director in the Office of Intergovernmental Relations. My name is Lorelai Williams. I'm a deputy director for the Seattle Department of Transportation. Uh, my name is, wow. <laughs> uh, it's Lauren Oton. I'm with the Seattle Office for Civil Rights, and I'm a, a gender equity strategic advisor. I'm Dolores Marks. I work with Seattle City Light, um, and I'm a strategic advisor. Hi, good morning. My name is Roseanne Lopez. I work with Seattle Public Utilities and Drainage and Wastewater, and I'm a division director for system management. Good morning. I'm Maja Jashan with the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. I'm the Language Access Program and Policy Specialist. And my mic doesn't work, so I'm going to use yours. My name is Tiffany Johnson. I am a Recreation Manager for Seattle Parks and Recreation. Hi, I'm Bridget Chill. I'm the Electrical Crew Chief for Facility Operations. All right, let's jump right in. Regan, do you want to kick us off? Actually, I'm going to acknowledge something. So the, you guys are going to read their bios. Yes, um, in the program. But what you're going to notice is another bio. Jennifer Chow could not join us today, so we just wanted to acknowledge um, that she was originally intended to be here, but that she couldn't be here. OK, so the first thing we're going to tackle is being seen. So what we know for sure, um, if you live in a marginalized body or an identity that is not uh, in a majority, that when you are the first, when you are the only, or if you are among a few in any workplace, that you can stand out a little bit. Right? Whether you try or not, just by showing up, that happens. Um, and so sometimes being seen is not necessarily by choice, it's the default. Um, and then sometimes you can't do enough to be seen. So um, first thing I would like to ask uh, Nicole and a couple other folks to chime in as well. Um, is there pressure associated with a visibility or even a hyper visibility of your position? And if so, why do you think that is? All right, um, I'd like to open by saying I just got back from Australia yesterday, so Ooh. if I go blank, that's why. <laughs> Still good, getting acclimated to the weather and the time. Um, so I'm the Tribal Relations Director for the city. Uh, my entire career, I've worked in government um, as some kind of tribal liaison or tribal representative or tribal policy expert. Um, I've had a lot of firsts in my career in terms of being the first on in an agency, in a federal agency, on a presidential campaign, you know, Native American working at a very senior level. Um, and every single one of those times, I've basically had to invent the position myself and then convince, you know, whatever person why this should exist and why it should be there, uh, which is absurd, um, but unfortunately still a very common reality. Um, I left the federal government and came out to Seattle, and I did not have to convince Seattle that the position existed. Um, it had existed prior. However, it was vacant for a long time before they brought the position back um, in 2012. Um, so in addition to how the difficulty of first becoming visible, then when you, when you do get into these positions, then you get to the hyper-visibility aspect of it, when you become the only one. Um, which is unfortunate. You know, I have worked in places, including the city of Seattle before, where there are other Native American employees, but in terms of being the person assigned to work on these issues, I'm all, it's always a lone wolf position. Um, and it's interesting because, on one hand, I never get the opportunity to be a supervisor or a manager. Um, but on the other hand, I, I have a very specific portfolio, but I also have the increased pressure of being the go-to point person, um, not only as a senior Native American employee at the city of Seattle, um, but in the community. Um, I have a very specific portfolio that would surprise people to hear. I mostly deal with negotiating large-scale infrastructure projects um, and mitigations for tribal nations, um, being that the city of Seattle sits in treaty territory, unlike any other major city in the US. Um, but as, of course, there are a myriad of issues facing the Native American community in Seattle and our surrounding tribes. Um, 
So it's, it's easy to succumb to the pressures of feeling like I have to be the one who does everything. Um, and that's in any position, you know, that's, that's not just here. And I think that there's benefit to it, you know, at least I'm here, but it's also I have to remind myself of what I'm actually here to do and that I can't do everything. Thankfully, things have improved a lot at the city since um, Deborah Juarez was elected and since she turned her committee into also representing Native communities. Um, as a staffer in OIR, you know, I can't just go around to other departments and kind of demand information or demand, you know, that they create pathways to work or collect data, um, but Council Member Juarez can do that and her committee has been tremendous help, particularly in helping to represent um, the interests of the urban Indian community. Um, but I'm sure, you know, she kind of feels the same pressure that I have. You know, she's a councilwoman, she, is, she represents District 5, but, you know, here we are in very unique positions, um, and there's a, a lot of pressure to represent every interest in everything. Um, now that I'm thinking about this sitting up here, we in Seattle are extremely lucky when it comes to tribal interests because, let's see, we have, um, a Native American who's the COO of King County. Uh, we've got two Natives on the Seattle School Board. The superintendent is Native. We've got Councilmember Juarez, myself. So we've got quite the team here, um, certainly more represented than any other city government in the country, um, certainly more representative than the federal government currently. But um, it's, it's still you know, a unique challenge to even have the team like we do in Seattle to represent all of these various interests. Um, so I would say, yeah, the. The visibility, we have to fight to be recognized, and then when we are recognized, it's just a deluge of all of the issues that you know we need to address. Thank you. Um, so, thinking about like kind of the flip side of that, the converse of what it means to maybe be invisible and have to fight to be seen. Um, on your career path, did you find yourself having to prove yourself more or differently than male counterparts? And um, Roseanne and Lorelai, I'm going to pose this to you. Like, what would be your advice for women in similar situations? You go. Okay, so I'll start. <laughs> so, um, as I was listening to Dr. Fariba, a lot of things, you know, were running through my mind and, and similarities as well. So, I started my career almost 20 years ago, right out of college. I'm a mechanical civil engineer, and I joined Olympic Pipeline Company, which is an energy company here locally that runs refined petroleum through the four refineries in the Northwest to Portland. So if you want to talk about um, being a woman in a predominantly male-dominated, uh, white male-dominated engineering field, uh, you know, those are some things to think about. And I, uh, when I think about it though, you know, initially we had, you know, I started in 1998, and on June 10th of 1999, there was an explosion in Bellingham that affected four young boys. And in term, there were fatalities, and it was heartbreaking and looking at the impact of the community. And so how do you bring a, a group of people together to be in service and think about how do you repair and build and know that this community is hurting as well? And so there was a team of people that came from BP nationally to come and support the repair, have community engagement, and kind of look at next steps. And um, you know, we had a local presence of our engineering staff, but a lot of the team that was leading things was you know, from Chicago, from Houston, from London, from BP. And I remember when we were, uh, assignments were being given out on who did what, you know, I was the only woman and the only woman of color on the team. And I remember some of my colleagues were doing uh, nitrogen purge calculations and integrity management and all these things on the pipeline. And then they would get to me and say, and Roseanne, can you handle logistics and order lunch? And I was like, well, I can order lunch and I can do a lot of other things too. But you know, I, kinda, I was new to the team, they kind of had an established team, so I took that opportunity to listen and watch and learn. And later in that year, um, a lot, it was around Christmas time and the holiday and a lot of our senior management had obligations and they were going home. But we still had to, um, have these relationships with the federal government, with the Department of Transportation. We still had to get things done. We still had to get repairs done. We had refineries that could not get their product down to market. And so, you know, they were like, well, should we wait till January when all of these men are back? 
And I said, I raised my hand and I said, well, I would like to volunteer for that position. I would like to do the day-to-day -day project management. I believe I can do it. And then I said to myself, oh my gosh, what did you just do? <laughs> um, and but then, you know, I uh, had a great group of people. You know, I think about the operations folks, the construction coordinators, the people that took me under their wing, and they showed me, like, here's what needs to get done. And you know, initially I had a lot of questions, but they knew it was because I wanted to learn. It wasn't a gotcha. It was like, um, you know, we see that you care about us. We see that you're asking these questions so that you could advocate for resources and money. And so they really fostered me in that position. But uh, it was an incredible experience. It was a lot of hard work, but in the end, uh, you know, I was able to demonstrate, you know, that we could get the work done. The regulators were able to see the engineering and the technical calculations that were done. Our senior leadership in Chicago that was reporting to London was able to see that that was done. And I think that kind of built kind of this reputation uh, from there on out to say, we believe that she can handle bigger projects with more responsibility. But I think the other thing that D Dr. Fariba also said, it's about your partner. So I have a wonderful husband, I have a wonderful family, and I have a powerhouse of a mother-in-law who's Vietnamese. She's four foot 11. <laughs> and she doesn't mess around. She loves you and she doesn't mess around. And I remember coming home from an operational day at the terminal at Harbor Island, and I said, Grandma, it's been a tough day. And her response was, Mommy, it's been a tough day for all of us. But if we can do, we must do. And can we do? And so those are the things that I think about um, in terms of like how do I bring, you know, how, how do you persevere? And so I think, you know, my advice for this too is don't wait for someone to ask you. You know, no one's going to be your best advocate other than yourself. So take that on and show people what you can do. You know, be intentional about making known what you want and letting people know how they can support you in that journey. And, you know, knowing who's going to advocate for you in the room when you're not there. You know, who's got your back? Who's your mentor? Who knows what you can do? And lastly, you know, when you look at opportunities to grow and learn, think about how you lift yourself up. So, you know, similar to what people said this morning, um, I had some, a lot of male mentors. To, to this day, they'll still take my call. Even though they're vice president to Soro or they're doing some other things, they have nothing, like, there's nothing that I, they can get from me anymore other than their belief in, like, me and wanting to help me succeed. So I, one of my things is, what can I do to be that person for others? And that's what grounds me. But really, don't wait for someone to ask you. Raise your hand. Take a leap of faith. Let it be a little bit scary and show them what you can do. So uh, I, my story is a little interesting, I guess, to me, because it's taken me a long time to really um, own being a woman uh, in a strange sort of way. I grew up with parents who um, basically instilled in me that I could be anything that I wanted to be. When I was little, it meant I wore jeans and I played cowboys and Indians and there was no way you could ever get me in a dress. Um, and then as I have grown in my career, I actually think oddly, I for a while was pretty oblivious to it. I got an engineering degree, I worked a lot in construction, and I frankly just didn't pay attention to what anybody else thought I could or couldn't do. I trusted in myself and I pushed forward and, and um, that was kind of the key to me getting a number of places. Um, now as time has gone on and I can reflect, I realize the places where maybe something would have stood in my way or somebody would have stopped me. But because fortunately I wasn't paying any attention and really didn't care, um, I was able to move past that. And uh, and I also like, you know, Roseanne said, and a number of other people have said, and I think you'll you'll get the common threads throughout the day. But I have never turned down a challenge, even if it scared the living daylights out of me. And um, I appreciate and. Um, Take advantage is probably the wrong word, but every time someone offers to help me, um, I also use those opportunities. So I, um, it's all about a team, having people that support you and believing in yourself. That's all I got. Thank you. <laughs> 
So the next tap topic that we want to kind of break apart a little bit is what it means to be heard um, and how we can hopefully amplify voices more or just deal with what it looks like when we're being silenced. So, uh, Manal. Um, so, I was hearing a lot of themes around um, invisibility and what really stood out to me were the points made about uh, what it takes to fight to be recognized and not just in your position but as a representative of community. With that, um, it, it ties directly to being heard because a lot of times when you are speaking out, you are speaking from your position but also using your access to advocate for others in your community. Um, the issue with this is that many women often feel uncomfortable speaking up in the workplace, particularly because they're being silenced. So I wanted to pose a question to Lauren and <coughs> Tiffany. How can we spot silencing and effectively <coughs> respond in solidarity when we see it? You wanna go first? You wanna go? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have one. Okay, I'll go first since I'm the smallest person at the table, it seems. <laughs> so um, this actually speaks volumes to my heart. I'm also a PhD candidate, and my research is around increasing gender implicit bias in city government. Um, too often, women have had to talk about glass ceilings and glass cliffs and having to fit in in the workplace instead of us um, increasing awareness to our male superiors or peers around the things that they are doing um, to make us feel less than in the workplace. Like Roseanne just said, a lot of times women are expected to, if there's a meeting, nine times out of 10, a woman is expected to set up the meeting, to have the food catered. We need to be more vocal. I am not from Seattle, I am from the other Washington. I'm from Washington, D.C., but have been in Seattle for two and a half years. And my first year um, in working in a very male-dominant uh, profession, parks and recreation, um, I just took a year of just observing, getting out, visiting all of our parks, visiting our trades. Uh, I managed community centers, meeting with my staff, and people were just, um, I wouldn't say that they were, were silent, but they were a little abrasive. And me, I'm, I'm a feel good person. I'm, hey, how you doing? I'm all in your face. I, I wanna know how I can support you. And one of the things that I noticed was that a lot of women, um, particularly, weren't really confident in, 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 in their, their duties and speaking out and uh, letting people know how they felt. So um, one of the things that I did as a leader, as a young leader, is even more difficult because people see you as, as a kid um, when in fact you're supervising people that are much older than you. So as a, as a, a female, as a leader, and as an uh, African American woman, I'm a triple minority in my workplace. Um, so having an open door, meeting people where they were, um, getting out, being visible, being seen, um, was one of the things that, that I kind of incorporated. And I brought just a different style um, that they weren't used to. And I, I hate to use this as an analogy, but it was like coming into um, a new relationship. Like, we all have had relationships. We've had good relationships and we've had bad relationships. It was as if I was coming into a, a new relationship where the, the partner had been scorned before. And so um, just being there and, and, and having like consistency was something that um, I found to be something uh, that people appreciated. And the more that people felt like they were welcome, the more that people felt that their, their words and their thoughts and their concerns and their ideas were being heard, the more they were bringing them forth. Uh, as a result, and I had no idea about women in power, I had no idea about women in motion. Um, I think, uh, I'm also in the Mayor's City Leadership Academy and that's probably how I'm sitting here. Holly <laughs> may have uh, volunteered me to be here. But uh, <laughs> she introduced me to uh, Sarah via email and I had no idea that these women groups were, were, were here in Seattle. And I'm like, this is amazing. Um, 
But prior to that, and knowing that from the research that I've been doing and applying theory to practice and bringing it into the workplace, in uh, Seattle Parks and Recreation, we're starting a Women in Lead Hership series. And our kickoff is actually next Wednesday. Um, but I reached out to Sarah and I was just like, hey, I heard you guys have this women's group and this is what we want to do. And so the, the purpose of the Women in Lead Hership series is to create an environment, a safe space for women to voice their concerns, to be paired. Um, we're doing um, quads, mentoring quads. Because in, especially in like our facilities and our, and our trades, there aren't a lot of women. So we're pairing women from different divisions in our department together in these mentoring quads. And uh, we're using a book called Lean In. And, and each forum, we're doing three forums and then an all day retreat. Uh, so we may be reaching out to some of you guys. Uh, Yes, <laughs> um, um, but we're, we're creating an outlet and an environment where uh, women can feel as if they are supported, that they're welcome, that they're empowered. We're doing resume building, interviewing. Uh, a lot of times, especially in male dominant professions, you don't get that. Roseanne, you, you've been very lucky to have male mentors. A lot of women don't get that. Uh, so I'm not going to take up the mic too long because sometimes I can talk. So um, it's a pleasure to be here. You all are amazing. Happy Women's History Month. Um, <laughs> I'm going to pass the mic to Lauren. Thank you. Um, can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about theory, but before I do that, I really want to acknowledge that um, I feel so fortunate. I work in a department that is majority women, um, and a majority women of color, and every single day I get to see them speak and show up as themselves. Um, I've learned so much about what it's like to be a woman of color in a government institution from the women that I work with and work for, um, so I think uh, we can often lose sight, those of us who happen to be in those kinds of circles, we can often lose sight of how lucky we are. Um, you know, I'm not in a male-dominated field, um, and, I'm, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm around my peers in many ways, so I'm really, I feel really happy for that. Um, I think that silencing comes from uh, the institutions that we've been raised in, that we live in, that we work in. Um, I, I think it happens on an individual, individual basis, sure, but, um, but I also think that it's part of what misogyny looks like. Um, and I'm going to step back for a second and say that misogyny, I, I'm taking a definition that is different from what we normally hear, which is that misogyny is about hatred of women. I actually don't think that. Um, and there are philosophers out there, in particular one who I've been reading recently, um, who says that or who says that misogyny is not the hatred of women, but rather an enforcement mechanism that's used to ensure that um, women stay in their place. And not just women, but anybody who challenges the norms established through patriarchy. Um, and that can take shape in a lot of different ways. So it can look like really egregious things, like sexual assault or violence, sexual abuse, sexual harassment, um, like egregious sexual harassment. But it can also look like um, being asked to make the coffee. It can look like being in a workplace that doesn't have family-friendly work policies or doesn't let you do a flexible work schedule because you have two young kids and you have to take care of your parents. Um, it can look like being a transgender or gender non-conforming person and coming to work every day and knowing that you don't have a bathroom that you can go into safely. Um, it can look like, gosh, so many things. I wrote a bunch down. <laughs> but. Um, knowing that traditionally women's work is undervalued when uh, you compare it to traditionally male <coughs> work. Knowing that as a woman in a traditionally male dominant field, you're likely being underpaid or being overlooked for you know, promotion, uh, promotion opportunities or special assignments. Um, you know, and those things are reflected in the institution that we work for too. I mean, if you look across the t different types of work that happen here at the city, Work that is traditionally female or that we deem is woman's work, um, you know, our human services, civil rights, um, our social services, things like that, like those, 
equity and social justice type positions. Like all of those are, are valued less financially or economically than you know, engineering positions, computer science. Um, and so we need to look at that. Why is that happening? I think that that's institutional misogyny. And I think that when you think about misogyny in this way, it can take us away from that, uh, that argument that like, well, people aren't misogynist or men can't be misogynist if they love their wives, if they love their sisters, they love their mothers, they love their daughters. Um, because it isn't about your interpersonal relationships so much as it is about upholding the structure that exists, yeah? Um, another way that it shows up is, you know, in meetings. Um, I have a tendency to not speak over people. I think a lot of that has to do with the way I was socialized, and I think a lot of women can re re um, relate to that. Um, I was raised in Latin America, I'm Panamanian, um, and you especially do not speak back to your elders. You don't speak over people. Um, at the dinner table, the boys are always served first. Um, you know, who's serving the table? It's the women and the daughters. Who's making the food? It's the women and the daughters. And I think that this is something that's replicated throughout. So an experience that I've had consistently um, in professional settings is, you know, I'll be in a meeting or having a discussion with a male colleague, for instance. Um, and I'll be interrupted a lot. Um, and they'll just speak over me as I'm trying to finish a thought. I also have a tendency to slow down when I'm explaining things, um, which I, I recognize I'm doing right now, but I think part of that is because um, I want to be clear about what I'm saying. It's another thing that we're told is we have to be 100%. We have to be really perfect, yeah. We can't just like, you know, take a risk as um, Fariba said. So, um, in terms of disrupting that, I think, one, we really need to look at our policies, right? We talked about family-friendly work policies. The city of Seattle didn't have paid parental leave, guaranteed paid parental leave, until a couple years ago. Um, and we know now that that has pay that's paid family leave as well, which means that if you have a sick parent or um, you know, a, a family member, a close family member, you can take time off to take care of them. We know that a lot of women in the workforce today have children and are taking care of aging parents. So that's this, you know, sandwich generation, um, which is what it's called. Um, I don't have children, but I have had to take care of an elder parent, you know, and, and at the time we didn't have uh, paid family leave. So that created a burden for me. Um, and then also when women are coming back into the workplace or parents are coming back into the workplace after taking time off, what are we doing to make sure that they can stay in their job, that they have a job to do, um, that they're fully supported, that there's a plan for reintegration? What do we do when we're in a meeting and you see a colleague consistently cutting off um, you know, a woman who's trying to make a point? Or what about a woman who makes a point or has an idea and is ignored by everyone in the room, but then her colleague, you know, Jack, says the same exact thing in a slightly different way, and everyone's like, thank you for that brilliant idea, yeah? Because it happens all the time. Because we deflect to masculinity, or not deflect, defer <laughs> to masculinity. Um, it's the center of all things. I wanted to do a quick exercise to show like, what I mean by this. Um, one is uh, you know, the way that we dress in a professional setting, or really anywhere in the world, like the clothing that we wear. It's really acceptable. Um, I, I just a show of hands, how many people are wearing pants in here right now? Yeah. Um, how many of you wearing pants identify as women? Women, yeah. And how many of you are wearing skirts or dresses? Yeah. <laughs> and how many of you wearing skirts or dresses identify as men? Yeah. So it's it's okay. We're centering. It's you know it's just a simple thing. We're centering masculine dress. You know, and I feel totally comfortable. I don't feel comfortable in dresses. I haven't in a long time. But. As a child, I was told that I should be wearing dresses, yeah? Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, women, women show up for women. This is clear. Women show up for women in the workplace. They show up for women in meetings when they see their colleague being talked over. They show up for women in a lot of different ways. They mentor other women. Uh, and I, I, I know that there are individual cases where 
men may mentor women or men may hold up women in the workplace or in a, you know, in a professional context in academia. Oof, academia. Um, <laughs> but men collectively don't show up for women the way that women show up for each other or the way that women show up for men, yeah? If you look at social justice, for instance, like women are at the helm of that movement and they are there for men, women, trans folks, gender nonconforming folks, they're there. They're leading the movements, they're driving the movements. I'm, by a show of hands, if you feel comfortable, how many men are in the room today? Yeah. So just want to take a moment to recognize that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And also, you have to talk to your friends, you know? Because like, cause like this, because what happens is like gender equity and women's advancement is seen as women's work. It's something that women have to do. And the reality is that this is men's work too. Yeah? Um, so. Thanks. I'm done. <laughs> um, table mics are hard to drop, but. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so. <laughs> Um, on the subject of women showing up for women, um, before I ask the next question, I want to um, give one of our panelists an opportunity to do just that, a model for us, um, what that looks like. So um, one of the other things that I've done regularly in my career is I admit when I make a mistake. And I realized quickly, as soon as I finished speaking, that when I described a game I played as a child, the description of it is offensive. So I wanted to acknowledge that. I immediately sat back and said, oh my gosh, what did I just do? So I just wanted to acknowledge to all of you that um, that was not intentional, and I'm owning it, and I apologize. Thank you. Just in case anybody didn't get it, she was referring to when she spoke of the childhood game Cowboys and Indians. Oh. Um, and I'll just say quickly too, I mean this is a common thing that happens at the city in meetings. Uh, quite often you'll hear people say things like let's powwow or running things up the totem pole. Um, at a certain point you can't get offended. You have to take the opportunity to have a teaching moment, laugh about it. Every once in a while I'll say it just to see if anybody gets uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> but I do appreciate Lorelai acknowledging that and just, you know, that we can talk about things like that here safely. So, um, on the continuing on the subject of being heard um, and kind of the opposite of being um, silent sometimes, sometimes it doesn't actually come from uh, folks of a different gender. Um, at times, women find themselves in conflict with each other. This is now breaking news. Uh, I know none of you have experienced this. You've never witnessed it. You've never participated in it. And also, none of you have seen the movie Mean Girls and didn't identify with any of um, <laughs> So it's often attributed to maybe generational differences, um, but it can also result from various other sort of identity-based relational differences between women. So I want to pose a question to Bridget and Maha. Um, what are your thoughts on these sort of, uh, these, these dynamics and how do we even begin to consider healing in the moment, like in the micro moment, but maybe in like the, in the grand scheme, um, how do we build solidarity as a collective in that way? Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm Bridget Cheel. I am an electrical crew chief uh, for the city. And um, I got into the trades in the mid-90s and on the advice of someone that said, Bridget, sometimes you just have to go to the end of the diving board and jump off. So I did. Um, we're f women. Uh, especially in the trades are very much in the minority, uh, I think less than 2% of us. So I didn't work with another female for years. 
and um, and so you think when you meet another woman in the trades, um, you will become allied. Um, and when we were prepping for this meeting, we realized that although there I have met some most amazing women, there is this uh, time when another woman will um, not support you and perhaps even go out of their way to undermine you. And I think the first step in that is to recognize that, you know, um, and to name it. And then we can discuss it on why, why does that happen? Um, and I think, um, you know, when we, we get put into these situations where there's really no playbook on how to navigate, um, it's a survival, it's a sink or swim. And, uh, and so we, you know, we, we foster these, um, uh, you know, we, we protect ourselves uh, from these past experiences. Um, you know, women that come into the trades were strong, you know, we have to be strong physically, we have to be strong mentally uh, to navigate uh, uh, this predominantly male field. Um, and um, we also have to continually um, prove our skills. Um, and I'm guilty of this, of this also is that assuming the lowest, you know, you meet another female, they will assume the lowest and you gotta work your way up from there. You meet a man in the same field and you will assume up and they work themselves down. Um, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, and you know, there's there's so many pitfalls. How how to you know? Don't be bossy, right? There's those um, adjectives that are uh, given to women that uh, have leadership skills, and that you know is um, so. You know, I I started thinking about how, how do we move forward with with that, um, and you know, first of all, is acknowledging that, and I think one of the big things for me is. Um, Forgiveness, forgiveness for ourselves that we, you know, my determination was don't make a fuss, be really, really good. And sometimes you're not, and that's okay. Um, and that when we talk about these things and come together, we become strong. And um, we can move forward as a collective and um, I think that's such a great thing, and it's so wonderful to be a part of this group. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Mahajashan. So um, before I started working for the city, I uh, used to, uh, I taught at university levels and I worked with a lot of students and my previous job right before was I worked with One America, which was an immigrant advocacy organization founded by um, now Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. So I was always surrounded by an amazing group of women um, working on community issues, always felt supported and such. And um, then I came to the city. Uh, that sounds more, but, that, but my role in the city is often I have to go and work with departments and help them figure out a language access strategy and how do they work with folks who ha don't speak English as a first language and how do they come up with, with what they need. And oftentimes I find myself as the youngest person in the room, the only person of color in the room, the one with the slight accent, the one coming and telling people, uh, maybe you should do it another way. And so. I would, when I would walk into a room and I would find male and females in there, I would get really excited that there were other women there, that they were either, whether they were um, women of color, whether they were white women, I would just get really happy because I was like, yes, I will have that support that you were talking about. And I sometimes found myself being interrupted by these women. I, or I would be in meetings where women would tell me how to do my job and have I thought about doing this and that. And it's funny because, as we have all talked about, when we are women showing up to a space, we give our 110%. I come to a meeting not just prepared, I am over-prepared. So to me, I would think, don't you, aren't you going through what I'm going through? Like, do you not understand that I am prepared? This is my job. And I would get really upset, and I didn't know how to um, react. But as Dr. Fariba was saying, we sometimes can't just sit with that upset all the time. That is paralyzing. And so I realized, you know, I women, um, and I, it's not a generational thing, but 
Women who are used to being the only ones in the space, I call it the unicorn syndrome, they sometimes don't know how to support other women because they themselves were never supported. You can't give something you were not given. And they sometimes don't know how to share the spotlight or how to open doors for others. And so what I've realized to do is I think of these three quick things to help myself um, center when I am at, in these spots. I. Um, put myself in their shoes and I think of myself, you know, I'm gonna come in and give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Maybe she doesn't realize what she's doing or there are other reasons for it and therefore I'm gonna approach it as a team teamwork attitude. I'm here as the language access expert. I'm not trying to take your job. I wanna make your job better. How can we work together as a team? So that's the first thing I try to do. The second thing I do is I try to summarize myself outside of that space with amazing mentors. And we have a lot of them, some of them sitting in the room here and in other spaces. And I try to surround myself with that network so I am grounded in who I am and in my truth. And so when I am there, I am presenting myself authentically. And I know we'll be talking about that in a bit. And the third thing is, is I made a promise to myself that I will not be that person. I want to open doors for other women because I believe that when I share the spotlight, it shines back on both of us and my job is to make sure everyone is uplifted and amplified in the room and therefore I, I took it upon myself, I will not be that person in the room. I am really loving the themes of uh, self-love and having compassion for people working through their internalized oppression. It was brought up multiple times on this panel. Um, from Dr. Fariba earlier. Uh, I think that's a great takeaway from this panel. Another thing that was mentioned, earlier I talked about moving forward in solidarity, and Bridget, you made a great point about what it means to, quote, move forward <laughs> as a collective. To be able to do that, we have to have a full understanding of gender equity, as well as what it means to provide opportunities and encourage and promote authenticity and an ability for us to be ourselves in the workplace. So I wanted to pose a question to Dolores and Lauren. Um, should we be analyzing race when discussing ge gender equity? And what impacts have you seen or experienced uh, that race and racism have on women in the workplace in particular? I'd love if you'd speak on that. Um, yeah, I think, well, I was going to, initially I, I was going to share some data on, you know, uh, women in the workplace, women in society, um, the differences between, can you all hear me? Yeah. The differences between, um, you know, women, uh, not that well, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, the differences between women uh, based on race, ethnicity, national origin. Um, but I think, um, and I will, uh, but I think that um, when we talk about these issues, we tend to veer toward data um, a lot. Uh, we veer toward data because that's the language of the institutions that we work in. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, data is important. It tells a particular story. Um, but devoid of the context, it doesn't tell the complete story. Um, so, you know, I think it's interesting. This question, this question felt really simple um, initially, but it's also like so complicated um, because I think the, the simple answer is, yeah, we should definitely be talking about race when we talk about gender. Um, I think the, the basic reason for that is that we, you know, we live in a heterogeneous world uh, we are not all the same. Um, we are all people who, you know, come from different places. We have different ethnicities, different races, different backgrounds, different national origins, different genders and gender identities. There's no way that we can look at gender equity and not and not look at, at race, which is such a huge factor. Um, and I want to say too, when we talk about women, I'm talking about trans women also. We need to stop saying or thinking that trans women are not also women. When I say trans, I mean transgender. Um, 
But yeah, the way that we experience the world is different. The way that we're perceived, the way that we're treated, the opportunities that are afforded us or that we are able to access um, our wealth, our generational wealth, our personal wealth, all of those things are different. And they're informed by our identities as women, but they're also deeply informed by where we come from, you know, who we belong to, um, who are our people. Uh, so I think, again, yeah, we definitely need to be talking about race. Um, because one thing that we know is that when you look at race and gender, when you look at the intersection of that, um, is that women of color, in particular black women, fare worse than white women in a lot of different indicators, yeah? So like we look at wealth, wealth is a really big one, right? I'm not talking about income alone, we're talking about wealth. Um, there was a recent study that came out in the Times, and I don't remember the figures, but if you looked at the um, total household wealth of a white, like typical white family or white household in Seattle, it was like 435,000 or something like that. And then you look at the household wealth for a black household, it was like $20,000. So that is a huge disparity. It's huge. There are women in those households too. Yeah. So. Um, so those things are really apparent. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a term called misogynoir um, that is combining both the misogyny that women experience at the hands of patriarchy and also um, fundamental anti-blackness that black women experience or that black people experience um, across the world. Um, and this is taking you know, the concept of interse intersectionality, which Kimberly Crenshaw talked about. Um, and it's coined by Moira Bailey. She says that you know, black women in particular are facing, another way of saying it is that the oppression of patriarchy or sexism or misogyny and the oppression of racism, those things come together in the bodies of black women. So the ways that black women experience the world are so different than the ways that white women experience the world. That doesn't mean that there's no opportunity for solidarity there. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity for solidarity. But it means that we have to recognize that what the world that we see and the world that we perceive and the way that we perceive is very different based on you know, um, how we grew up and who we belong to. Um, I wanted to... to uh, Oh yeah, I, I wanted to take it out of the workplace, if that's okay, for one second, um, and relay uh, relay a quick story that I read about recently to demonstrate what I'm talking about. Um, I know that we've heard a lot about eviction in the last couple of years. Um, one of the things that we know about eviction that, that has come out in research is that black women in particular are um, the most evicted population in, in the country. Um, a study that came out recently showed that in King County that is also true. Um, and there's a writer who said that, uh, you know, poor black men are being locked in and poor black women are being locked out. Um, and, and this is true. And the way that that's happening, and I talked about um, institutional misogyny a, a minute ago, but this misogynoir, um, if, you'll, if you'll allow me that, is that um, we have this whole combination of laws and policies that target women and target black people or black communities. Um, and this particular case, there was a woman in, um, in Missouri who um, had called the police for a domestic violence dispute um, four times over the span of a year. And due to that, she was evicted from her home. I'll get into why. In that city, there was a law, I think the law has finally been repealed, but there was a law that says that um, if you call the police more than two times within like a eight month span, um, you will lose the right to live in that city. You will be exiled essentially from that city for a period of time. Yeah. So there are a couple things happening there. One, oh, and it's because of the you're, you're endangering the lives of police officers. Yeah. OK. <laughs> um, it's funny, but it's, it's not. Um, so 
what ha what's happening there is that it's silencing women, telling them that if they report, if they call the police to protect them, to report domestic violence, um, they may be kicked out of the city. They may lose their right to live in the city. So it's better to just, you know, take a risk and shut up or, you know, try and move yourself out. So the argument is, why don't they move themselves out? Well, a lot of people can't just leave, a, one, you can't just leave an abusive relationship. And sometimes it's economically impossible to do that. Um, and then there are all of these other economic reasons why this woman was in the position that she was in. So I just bring that up to say that if these sorts of things are reflected in our community, these sorts of things are going to be reflected in our workplaces too. I think, um, you know, if we look at if we look at the city, um, the majority of administrative positions, administrative assistant type positions, are held by women of color. They're held by black women. You know, that's institutional misogyny and racism. Um, so yeah, I feel like I've taken up a lot of time, and it's quite heavy, um, but. I'll stop there. Sure. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's check this one. Much appreciate it. Can you guys hear me? That's good. Um, so, uh, I think I want to start out by talking a little bit about myself. Um, I am the, and the, that individual who will, um, behind the scenes, defend and look out for other people before I look out for myself, hands down. Um, and I say all that to say that, um, that that perspective that I have, the person that I am, kind of guides how I navigate. Well, it would guide how most people navigate. Um, and the particular situation I'm actually going to share is uh, related to um, a promotion that I had. Uh, and uh, I had an opportunity to actually negotiate my salary. And initially, um, I didn't want to do it. And I didn't want to do it because I didn't feel that I deserved to do it. Right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, but being the person that I am, when other people were um, hired on uh, at this uh, place of employment, I always fought for them to get the top salary that they could get, always, hands down. Um, but when it came for me to do it, I, was, I didn't want to do it. So the offer came, it was low, <laughs> super low. And I'm like, wait a minute, I got to fight. So me being me, um, I go and I do all this research, prepare all these facts and numbers, look at all these comparable uh, positions, blah, 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 blah. Got a really good argument. And I'm like, here's my argument. And they're like, nope, we're still going to, we're, we're going to be low, but we're going to be a little bit higher than that low. And I'm like, mm, I don't know. So then we go back and forth again, right? And, and, and I put more information out, you know, find out more, just dig in and like, this is, you know, I deserve this. I'm starting to really believe it now. And they're like, no, we'll give you a little bit more. Just creep it up just a little bit more. So finally, I'm like, this is taking too long, right? <laughs> and I got people that are depending on me or that want me to have this role and they, and I feel that pressure too, because if I'm in that role, then again, I can be in a position to help people, which is kind of my thing, right? So I say, okay, I'm gonna accept this, I'm gonna accept it. I wanna like it, I'm gonna accept it. Okay. Um, so then, it doesn't stop there. So we negotiate, um, and after we negotiate, and this is where the rub really happened, uh, the paperwork has to go and get approved by the higher up. So the higher up gets it and they're like, no, what you've negotiated, way too high. The initial offer that the company made, still too high. And I'm like, huh, then this is interesting. And it's interesting because this higher up, white male, um, had uh, someone on his level team who was in the same type of position that I was moving into. Similar qualifications that other individual had, again, white male, um, similar credentials, and that individual was making, I don't know, we'll say $7, $8 more than what they wanted to start me at. 
regardless of the fact that I felt personally that the role that I was going into was more diverse, um, required a different type of skill set, um, didn't allow me to kind of just sit at my desk. I had to be out there. Um, but yet, my value was less. And so that hurt. I, I mean, I'm not going to even lie. It, it hurt. <laughs> And it hurt because I, I felt like I put a lot into that organization. I felt like I was deserving of even more than what I was accepting. Um, but I also felt like that was like a, a punch in the face. It, 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 it was a punch in the face. So why is it that my value was not as high as? Why is it that my contribution was not as good as? Um, why is it that I, needed, I was treated differently? Um, at the end of the day, the negotiation already happened. So uh, they didn't change the salary. It ended where it was at. But what I will say is that where it did land, it actually put me behind the curve. And I say that because uh, um, when, you, when I negotiated my salary um, at that job, because it wasn't where I thought it should be, I was always going to be behind the curve when other people got their advances and raises every year. And so, it diminishes, I think, your, my, I can't speak for everybody else, but it diminished my ability to really kind of give my all to the company and the organization, which is kind of unfair, right? Um, and, and it's unfair that you have to put your feelings aside in order to keep moving and striving and, and moving forward. Um, but I say all that to say that, um, one thing I was proud of myself is that I took the leap, right? I, I, I went in there and I fought for myself. Um, I probably should, I could have fought harder, I think. Uh, but again, it's just not my personality to do that. Um, so I think that's all I have to share. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that experience about negotiating salary. Um, it's a huge gender equity issue. It's one at the center of many um, women's initiatives. And um, to follow up on, on that question, I would like to go back to Lauren's point earlier when she was telling the men, uh, this is not a woman's problem. This is all of our problem. What you're hearing up here is not a woman of color problem. It is not a black woman's problem. It is all of our problem if we are going to move forward as a collective. It needs to be recognized as such. Also, uh, without developing that racial analysis, we will never, a person can never have a full understanding of gender equity. Lacking that racial analysis and or being resistant to develop, developing that racial analysis, it actually hurts the movement by negatively impacting the uh, credibility of the movement as a whole. If you think about um, the fight for e equal pay for equal work, for example, if we take race out of that analysis, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem as though there is a gender wage gap at all. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, white and Asian women make more than black and Latino men. So where's the, where's the gender issue? Or was, yeah, where's the gender disparity? However, if you develop your racial analysis and embrace that, and you look within every uh, racial group, white men are still making more than white women. Uh, uh, Asian men are still making more than Asian women. Black men are still making more than black women for the same work. Indigenous men and indigenous women, Latinx, and, the, and it goes on. Um, so it's actually the racial analysis that completes and informs the gender analysis. Mm -hmm. We need to develop both and they both, it needs to be an intersectional analysis if we are going to move forward in solidarity and actually change some of these disparities and close them for the collective. On that note. <laughs> On that note, I really want to uh, wrap up with this final question and then open it up to the audience to ask our wonderful panelists anything that's on your mind. Um, we're talking about women of color in particular at this moment, and women of color have to navigate our professions with implicit biases and barriers and stereotypes of both a person of color and a woman. So 
I'll open it up to whoever wants to answer. How do you bring your whole authentic self to work? So I think I'll start. So I'm a person who wears her heart on her sleeve, who doesn't hold back. Um, to give you some information about me and my family, my son, his, he's 12, his name is Trent. He's named after Trent Reznor, the lead singer of Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> my husband told me that was non-negotiable. Um, but on top of that, you know, Trent is on the autism spectrum. And I didn't realize that, and he was two years old, and I thought he was speech delayed, and we went to specialists, and um, you know, then finally it just kind of dawned on me, you know, like, well, what's going on? And then I remember when I realized that I cried the whole weekend, the whole weekend. And then my husband said, okay, that's enough. What's within our control, what can we do? So we researched things, we looked at what organizations are there, we move forward. And I, I say that in context because I think about my son and how sometimes what he's thinking and what he's feeling, there's a disconnect, like a dub tape, right? There's a couple minutes delay, and I could see it in his face, I can see it in his emotion. And I think to myself, I can speak. I can you know, have this conversation with someone. I can let them know what's wrong. You know, and so I try not to shy, in my old self, I may have shied away from something, but now I just try to hit it head on. And I'll talk to my colleagues, and like I experienced something with one of my male colleagues, and I said, um, you know, I said, yes, and. I know you're frustrated, I know you're frustrated with my team, you know, but we still need to figure out what we need to do, because I feel that the decision that we're about to make is not the right decision. And it's not right for the community, and it's not right for how we do business. So in our yes and, how do we go from there? I also think about my dad, who was also an engineering group in the Philippines. And he had a small construction company. And he said, one day, you know, he pulled me aside. He handed me a shovel, and he said, start digging. And I'm doing it, and I'm not doing it very well. But you know, in the end, he pulls me aside, and he says, I don't expect you necessarily to do this for the rest of your life but I expect you to know what it feels like. And to that day, it has carried me in how I do my work. So when I look in a meeting and I say, how are decisions being made? You know, who's deciding the priority of the work or the money that's being spent or how we serve the community? And why is it for a multi-million dollar project that's very technical in nature, where are the operations maintenance folks here? And why don't they have a seat at the table? So I think when I first came to the city two and a half years ago, it was a little disruptive, right? Because that's not how we did things. It went in the face of who held power, you know? But I think in the end, it's not about us as an individual. And I said, at our level in leadership, it is not about you. If you're thinking about how you individually are going to be recognized, you are in the wrong profession. And so um, I want us to think, that, like, so when I bring myself, or like as a person of color, I'm just demonstrating who I am, what's important to me. You know, people make a comment like, why do you eat your lunch in the lunchroom when you have an office? Like, is it because you care about us and want to learn more about us? And I share that with my colleagues to say, like, this invisible force field that's around your office, excuse me, you need to, like, go out and talk to people and see what's important to them. And so I think it's just like, I am authentic. I let people know. I had a colleague who reported to me once that said, not your finest hour, boss but I know you can do better. And I valued that because it's like, then I learned how to grow. And you know, it's, you just tell me everything's okay, I will never learn. But if you tell at a, the same boss, that VP at Tesoro, who said, you know, I think you did about a seven out of 10. But with this, this, and this will get you to a 10. So that's what's important to me. That's how I demonstrate it. And I, as I was looking in the room, I see two of my colleagues. I'll give a shout out to Ellen and Eileen. It's like, who are the people that ground you? Who are the people that tell you all the things that you're not seeing, including when you have spinach in your teeth, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's what I think about. That's how I show up as a leader. And I don't think about, and before I'd say like, oh, that's not how my male colleague would do that. But then I'm like, well, this is what brought me here and this is how I made it to my journey and I'm just gonna be authentic to that. Okay, um, I'll keep it really, really brief. Um, but in the field of parks and recreation, uh, I knew that that was the career that I would be in since the age of like eight. 
my mentors are parks and rec professionals. I was the kid that was always at the community center, and I knew it. It wasn't until I got into college that I realized that it was a very male-dominant uh, profession. And in fact, currently, in 2019, out of more than 20,000 parks and recreation organizations throughout the entire country, less than 24 um, of them have um, women of color chief executive officers. And I knew that that was a place that I was, that I'm going to be, not a place that I was going to be, because I'm still on that route there. Um, but one of the things that I learned was to be the change that you want to see. Um, so every morning, and I wear it around my chest every day, um, I, I always go by the quote, be the change that you want to see. If there are things that you see that you don't like, you do something to change it. How, how, how have these women been able to propel and make it to the ranks of, of um, this level? Um, there's another acronym that I use with my staff and another one that I, I cherish. I'm big with like quotes and feel good like stories and stuff like that. Um, but I like the Q-tip rule. And the Q-tip rule is in the workplace, I can't look around and see all of the things that are against me. If I'm going to achieve and get to that next level, I have to quit taking it personally. So the Q-tip rule, like a Q-tip, quit taking it personally. I, I look at all of the work. I look at all of the work as professional work. I don't, I don't take people's thoughts or their comments. I don't give a, a hoot about how you feel about me. I'm here to get the work done. I'm passionate about the work for people, and that's why I'm here. All of the rest of it, Q-tip, quit taking it personally. And that, that's basically it. Wait, plot twist. I would love if Reagan would answer the same question oh. because so, I love you. Come on. First of all, she just said wrap up. Oh. People don't need. Reagan, can you be quick? Yes. There you go. We all want to hear from you. It's a setup, guys. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So, <laughs> navigating our professions in these sort of spaces, I. Um, I try really hard to be myself. I've made my peace with the fact that everybody will not enjoy that. Um, <laughs> but that my job is to do my job, right? And um, I've been doing the kind of work that, I, I work on the Race and Social Justice Initiative for um, City Light. And I've been doing anti-racism work in organizations for about a decade. Um, no one but the person that hired me was ever excited that I was there. Um, because like some of our panelists have said, it was like my job is to come in and to change the way things the way people think and how they make decisions in their workplace. So my job is to inherently tell you that you could be doing better or that you're doing something wrong, right? Um, and I don't know that I bring sunshine with that. Um, <laughs> but um, it's my duty. So I have to make peace with the fact that I may not be the most popular kid, and I'm cool with that. Um, I don't know if everybody else is. But, um, but I also want to, without like opening up a whole other sociology session, um, because that was beautiful and I never wanted it to end, um, I'm also aware that in the body that I'm in, as black, as woman, as sometimes the youngest person in the room, and in past workplaces being the oldest person in the room, weird, um, that none of what I say or do is coming through in some like uncontextualized way, even if you're unaware of it, right? So my pushing back on things will sometimes be received and heard as angry, right? And in this body, that makes me an angry black woman. It may be a complainer. Literally, my job is to find things and complain about them <laughs> and suggest change. Um, that said, I don't think that that's different than what lots of women, if not all, experience in whatever their job is, right? If you are a customer service professional, if you are in operations, if you sit in a cubicle, if you work out in the grand air of it all, right? Like, I think we all sometimes have to make our peace with not necessarily being liked, which is something we're also socialized to do. We get to like each other. <laughs> um, and I keep seeing this meme pop up on Instagram um, and Twitter that says, like, be, be, the part, like, be the queen that fixes another queen's crown without telling the world it's crooked. Um, I mean, you can, my job is to announce the crookedness, but <laughs> um, for accountability's sake, but at the same time, I think that we could all stand to do a little bit more of that, and then we all get to be ourselves, complete humans that are fallible, that are not perfect, but that are making an effort to just um, make our spaces and our world and our workplaces better. 
Thank you. So, um, on that note, we may have eaten up your Q&A time, but um, we Did want we? to kind of toss it back okay. to our, our hosts for the day. Um, and thank you all so much for your attention and your support, and we'll love to keep seeing you and talking with you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to our panel for participating in today's event. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll have you guys take your seats um, back at the front of the room. So while they're getting resettled, we just have two more speakers to close out this morning's um, event, and I'll be introducing Councilmember Lorena Gonzalez. Before she comes up, I'm going to say a couple words about her. So first, um, I want to say thank you so much to Councilmember Gonzalez for sponsoring today's room. We could not have done this without her to have this beautiful space for today's event. And I'll just let you know a little bit about her. So if you don't know, Councilmember Gonzalez is a citywide elected official. When she was elected in 2015, she became the first Latina and Latinx council member to serve on the Seattle City Council. So she is history making in that sense. Yeah, a big round of applause for that. Before she became a council member, she worked as a civil rights attorney and had a very successful career in law. So she brings all of that lived experience and professional experience with her into her council member role, where she's worked on a number of really important pieces of legislation and policy work. Some of that includes spearheading legislation as far as police reform, secure scheduling, fighting to make Seattle a welcoming place for immigrant and refugee families, um, she's also a champion of women, and so she led the passage of expanding paid parental leave to all Seattle employees and has fought for policies to close the gender wage gap as well. This summer, she's going to be doing something really important, and that's leading the effort, the implementation plan for the recently passed education levy. And so some of that work includes closing the opportunity gap by expanding early learning for families from um, low-income families and communities of color. She'll also be helping to make childcare more affordable and accessible. And as women in the room, we all know that that's really important to us because when childcare is unaccessible and unaffordable, it's often the mother who stays home with their children and that can take them out of the workforce for a while and it can impact their careers and their earning potentials long term. So she'll be doing some really important work around that. Um, on a personal note, I just want to say that yes, I get to see Councilmember Gonzalez in my professional life and her advocacy work and out in the community, but also behind the scenes where she is just incredibly funny and warm and whip smart and she is a true champion of women in the legislative department and especially women of color. So with that, let's give a round of applause to Council Member Gonzalez. Oh my gosh, it's my face. Um, <laughs> I still, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Like I, I definitely suffer from the imposter syndrome because um, I still can't get used to seeing. Um, the, the title council member in front of my uh, name. And so every day that I walk to the city hall and I walk into um, the legislative department because I have this like access badge that lets me into just about anywhere, I'm just still in shock and awe of it. Um, so, uh, so I'm Lorena Gonzalez. I am so grateful um, to be here and I'm grateful because I'm just so grateful for all of you. And I know that the work that you all do um, every single day, day in and day out can sometimes be the unsung uh, work and you all are definitely the heroes of the city that make sure that our city continues to work and that the people who rely on us to in some cases survive by staying warm um, and by uh, you know just being able to um, live in their households is super super important so I want to thank you all for the work that you do as public servants um, for the city every every single day and hope that we can uh, live up to um, all of the expectations you have of us as we go through um, through this work. So I also want to thank the Women in Power and Women in Motion um, uh, organizations and leaders. You all did an amazing job organizing this. And I 
understand that it was, this is the second time that you all have done this. Uh, it's also um, the first time I believe you guys have been completely sold out. Um, and, uh, and so when I was talking to Sarah over here and she mentioned that to me, I said, well, I think that just means we need a bigger room. So let me know. Uh, I'm happy to find that bigger room for you. I might be able to use my little access badge to get you in. <laughs> uh, call me. Let me know. Um, so I, I, um, I know you all are getting, I'm standing between you all and lunch, so I, I won't belabor my comments. But um, in addition to just wanting to say thank you, I just wanted to make sure um, that you all continue to feel like you are part of the city family. I know that we all face great challenges continuing to be part of the city family and to continuing to build the city that we want to see um, uh, our city be. And that means making sure that we're tackling issues of affordability, not just for the people who work outside of the Seattle Municipal Tower, uh, but also um, for people um, who work for the city of Seattle. And some of the things that I'm really excited about working on is not, uh, not only pushing for additional affordable housing investments throughout the city, but also making sure that we're, we're, we're taking head on some of the unique issues facing women in our workforce. So for example, making sure that women, all women throughout the city, have a fair and equal access to promotional opportunities. That is so important for you all to feel like we are investing in your development. And if we're not getting it right, we have to hear from you about that so that we can do better. It also means bringing uh, an affordable childcare on site. King County has the uh, daycare center on site. We should have one too. And so we're going to be, uh, you know, last budget season, I worked with Council Member Teresa Mosqueda on adding uh, money to the budget to be able to finally set up, an, uh, set up an on site child care facility. And we're going to be fighting really hard the rest of the year to make sure that those dollars get spent and that we set up that child care facility because we all know that that's what we need. Uh, I am also uh, celebrating my, my one year anniversary as of last November, and I'm hoping to be able to use that child care facility sometime soon. So I have a little bit of interest. <laughs> interested in making that happen. Um, and then, you know, I just really want to acknowledge um, as a follow-up to the conversation that just happened around a lot of uh, wonderful remarks made by this panel about who they are when they show up to work. And, you know, it's really easy for, um, for folks to see me uh, with that title and in this position and somebody who always gets to get on the camera and give speeches and think, wow, she's like really made it. She's got it. She's got it all under control and everything is fine. But let me tell you that I'm still, every single day, I show up in this world as a woman and a woman of color, the daughter of immigrant parents from Mexico who first came to this country as undocumented immigrants who grew up in extreme poverty, who earned her first paycheck at the age of eight who knows what it means to be sprayed with pesticides because I used to be a migrant farm worker living in migrant farm labor camps in central Washington state. That's who I am when I show up every day. I'm not council member. I am Lorena Gonzalez, the daughter of immigrant parents, the daughter of Emilio and Elvira Gonzalez, somebody who understands what it means to live in this city and see things that I so desperately want to fix because I understand what it means to not have opportunity and to not feel like you've been treated fairly. And even though I'm a council member, I still experience feeling like an imposter. I still experience being treated like the other. So when I show up across the, across the street to the Columbia Center Tower, for example, because the city attorney's office is asked to interview me, and I check in with a receptionist, and she then asked me if I'm the translator. <laughs> That's an experience. And when I was a civil rights lawyer, I remember being the youngest person in the courtroom, being the only woman in the courtroom, being the only person in the courtroom, and showing up with the name Lorena Gonzalez. So of course, I'm the translator. It would be impossible for me to be the actual attorney of record. It would be impossible for me to show up in that space and be a council member. So imagine my surprise when no less than two minutes later, I see an attorney come out of the restroom and then he proceeds to ask me if I'm the interpreter. <laughs> All in the span of five minutes. And you know, it would be really easy to just shirk and to just be like, ugh, all right, well that's terrible. But I made a choice in that moment 
And I looked at both of them and I said, you know what? I am not the interpreter and I am offended that you would think and assume that I'm the interpreter because of what I look like and what my name is. Don't do that to me. I don't appreciate it. I didn't at any point tell them that I was a council member. <laughs> uh, I did not want to pull rank. But let me tell you, I, I, you know, for me, and I share that with you because it was hard for me as a person with this title who lives in this building to stand up for myself. And I don't think that people would expect that from me or for somebody who's in my position. But I share that with you because it's, it's really important for us to acknowledge that from every single rank in the city family, this is our struggle, especially if we show up as women and women of color every day in our job. And it's important for us to challenge ourselves personally and professionally to, to push back on some of those experiences. And we can do that respectfully and with dignity and with pride. And I just wanna to continue to challenge all of you um, in that way. And I also really wanna encourage you all to be kind to each other and amongst each other. You know, in my office, we oftentimes joke around about how somebody from our community does something that we don't like, and then we immediately say like, this is why we can't have nice things. This person ruined it for us. Um, and, and you know, and there's some truth to that. It's really important for us. We, have, we carry a big burden as women and women of color when we show up. You know, we're the representatives of our community. We're the representatives of our gender. We're the representatives of our race. Um, and, and, and I don't wanna discount that burden that we all feel. I just wanna acknowledge it and feel it and allow ourselves to feel it together and really figure out and struggle together as to how we are going to rise to the challenge to make sure that people um, see us for who we are when we show up, uh, understand that there is value to that because there is and how we can use that value to not only better our own lives, but better the lives of the people that we show up every single day um, to serve in the roles that you, that you fulfill. So thank you all so much. It's my pleasure to be here with you all. And it's, importantly, it's my pleasure to serve each and every one of you. Thank you. So I prepared some closing remarks, but I don't even think I could top that. Like, I can't top all of this. Um, so I will just be brief because I know we are all getting hungry. I know I am. So I have some just reminders and some thank yous. Mayor Durkin, Council Member Lorena Gonzalez, thank you again. And our keynote speaker, Fariba. Um, and to our panel, man, we couldn't have done this all without you. A reminder to sign in, um, we, op we made the opportunity for everyone to do it through Cornerstone, so you got training credit. If you did register, if you want to be registered, please do that. Sign in so you get our mailing list. Um, if you want to reach out to Women in Motion or Women in Power or anybody, uh, please come see us. We'd love to connect with you and keep building this community. This event was designed to be an opportunity for learning, celebration, and community. Um, and with that in mind, we created some little note cards. So as you're walking out, if you want to grab a note card and just write a note to someone who inspires you or someone you want to say thank you to, um, it's just a little gesture, but sometimes it goes a long way. And let's see. This message uh, is up to you and however you want to do it. And we just appreciate everything. The Seattle Channel has filmed this. Um, thanks to all the city departments who have helped, all the volunteers. And it will be a recording that will be available in the future. Thank you again.